okay, I'm working through electrodynamics. We're in the first semester of electrodynamics, and for me, that's electric and magnetic fields. We're in chapter six. So I'm gonna give you my shortest possible summary of the key ideas in chapter six. We have to start off, uh, we're talking about magnetic fields, and we're talking about materials in magnetic fields. So let's just talk about a couple of things, first of all. Remember that if I have um, a loop of current or any kind of current distribution, I can describe that with a magnetic, magnetic dipole moment M. Uh, so if you have a material, those magnetic dipole moments are due to electron spin and electron orbits, quote, orbits, in the material. So some materials have different magnetic properties. I've oversimplified that a lot, but it's fine. And it, we could represent all these different magnetic dipole moments in a material. I'm just drawing them as arrows. Now imagine that I apply a magnetic field to this material. Well, what's going to happen? All these magnetic dipole moments make magnetic fields, and I apply a magnetic field. So remember that if I have a dipole moment, I'll just write it right here, M, and then I apply a magnetic field, B, well, that's going to exert a torque on that magnetic dipole moment. The torque is M cross B. Now, that one actually you can show if you just take a, a square loop and put it in a magnetic field. It's not too difficult to calculate the torque, uh, and you can show that that's the same thing. There's actually going to be a force on that, too, uh, if there's a divergence in M dot B, but the force on a dipole due to a magnetic field is the divergence of M dot B. So you don't actually have to have a diverging magnetic field uh, if you have a dipole, you can still have a magnetic force, but there has to be a divergence. So if you have a con if you have just a square loop um, in a constant magnetic field, there's no magnetic force, but there is a torque. But the point is that that magnetic field is going to exert a torque on all these dipole moments, and they're going to change their orientation and change their magnetic properties. And that's what we're trying to deal with in this situation. Okay, I drew another picture right here because I do want to talk about um, just briefly, and then we can go over the main things. This is, there's a difference between bound currents and free currents. So imagine that all these little dipole moments are little electron orbits. That's not really how that happens. But imagine that it is. So these electrons are moving in circles, so they're not getting anywhere. It's not a current that goes anywhere. The net current in this situation would be zero. So that would be a bound current. A free current would be, imagine I have a current density J, so there's a current moving through there too. So I can have both of those things happening at the same time. I can have uh, these bound currents and free currents. It's a lot like bound versus free charges when we talk about the displacement field. Bound charges are charges that separate due to uh, an induced dipole, and then free charges would be extra charges they add on that. So we have that same thing here. But let's go back and talk about the vector potential, because that's going to be useful. I'm going to skip some steps here. So remember that we can uh, calculate the vector potential A as mu naught over 4 pi m cross r hat over r squared. So this would tell me the vector potential due to some magnetic dipole moment. We did that in the last chapter. Um, and then you could calculate the magnetic dipole moment if it, you could do it this way, I, I, A. But a lot of times if, if you can't, if you don't know the current, you don't know the area or something complicated, you'd have to integrate one half the integral of R cross J dV is the magnetic dipole moment. So you can integrate and find that, where J is the current density. And we also have uh, a new definition. This is the magnetic dipole moment, but imagine that I have some, some volume, and I want to find the magnetic dipole moment per unit volume. We call that the magnetization M. That's a lowercase m. That's a capital M. It's lowercase m per volume. So if I use that up here, I can write the vector potential A as mu naught over 4 pi, the integral, instead of m cross r hat, I can say the magnetization 
cross r hat dv over r squared. So this m dv is going to give me my dipole moment, so I get the same thing. But I have to integrate over a volume, and that's the magnetization. Now for a math trick. Um, the math trick is that if I write, remember I can write um, the, I can use this gradient of 1 over r property and get 1 over r squared. We did this, when did we do this? We did this previously, we did the same trick. But if I do that, I can write this as, uh, I can add this term in there. That's what I'm doing right. I got that confused. Yeah. And I get the following. I'm going to skip to the final point and then I'll write it out. I'll tell you what it is. It's mu naught over 4 pi, the integral of del cross m, capital, dv, plus mu naught over 4 pi, the closed surface integral of 1 over r, and this is 1 over r too, Um, m cross n hat dA. So what happens is when you do this, you can make it, you can use integration by parts and you get two terms. And then the second term, you can use Stokes theorem to turn a volume integral into a surface area integral. And we get this term right here. Now you see that we have this del cross m and we have this m cross n hat. So we're going to define this as our bound current density. So the bound current density is going to be equal to, this is important, I'll put it over here. JB is the curl of the magnetization. It's important. And then over here, we're going to say M cross N hat where n hat is perpendicular to the surface, this is going to be the surface current density. We're going to call that Kb, bound surface current density, is m cross n hat. Those are really important. Okay, where are we at now? Got that. So now I can write my vector potential, which remember, I can use to find the magnetic field, mu naught over 4 pi, the integral of j bound dv over r, is it r squared? r, yeah, plus mu naught over 4 pi k bound dA over r. So I can break that into two bound currents, right? This is, and this is in a region with the magnetization. So I have a bound current density and a bound surface current density. And so the total current density, J, we can say is J bound plus J free, just like I said before. Okay, now let's write Ampere's law. Ampere's law says the curl of B is mu naught I N. No, J. J. But J is this. So what I'm going to do is to divide both sides by mu naught. So I have the curl of B over mu naught. It's a constant. I can bring that in. Is equal to J, which is J bound plus J free. Now, J bound, I can say is this. So this is going to be the curl of B over mu naught is J bound, which is the curl of the magnetization, plus J free. Now I can subtract this from both sides and factor out the, uh, the derivative here, and I get the curl of B over mu naught minus M is equal to J free. Here, we are going to define this as the H field. So H is B 
over mu naught minus m. And if you think back to the displacement current, the displacement field, I'm sorry, in electric fields, what we did was to define the displacement field so that we could have a, a term that really didn't depend on the type of material. It was independent of the material. We said, what's going to happen to this thing? And then we can add the material stuff in later. And that's what we did here, right? Because we've included the magnetization of the material in H. Now we can write Ampere's law as the following. The curl of H is J free. Or you can write that as the integral. The integral of H dot DL is equal to uh, I free enclosed. And that doesn't have the mu naught. Because remember, we did we pulled the mu naught in over here. So that's why it doesn't have that. OK. So now one more thing, not a biggie deal. Um, <clears throat> in a lot of materials, uh, the magnetization is proportional to the magnetic field. So the stronger the magnetic field, the more magnetized it is. And we did this with the dipole, induced dipole moments too. So we define what's called the magnetic susceptibility as this. M is chi M H. And, and it, I know it doesn't seem makes sense to put the H there. We should use B, but that's what they do. They use the H. Uh, and so that depends on the material. Now, just like before, uh, we can write H in terms of B, and we get this. B is mu naught times uh, H plus M. And B is mu times H and this is the uh, susceptibility. So that's the way, this is called the, the, perme the permeability and the susceptibility. I don't really care, they're just engineering terms or just to deal with the materials. So that's what we have here. We can use Ampere's law with the H field and not worry about all those bound charges and just worry about the free charges. So H depends on the free charges. And then if we want to find out the full thing, then we have to go back and find B using the magnetization and the susceptibility. OK, so that is really confusing. But magnetic fields are confusing enough on their own. Hope that helps.